Hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. Uh, we're an online resource and community for up-and-coming screenwriters, and today we are talking pilot analysis of the new HBO show, House of the Dragon, or Hot D. Hot D. I was so confused. I really didn't know what you were talking about, and then I was like, wait a dang second. I get it. <laughs> I read, I don't know if this is true, but I read that that's what George calls it. Hot D. Which I could totally see happening. He's like, hey he guys, let's he, talk yeah, about that's Hot D. That's confirmed. <laughs> that's ridiculous. I love it. Um, so yeah, today we're talking House of the Dragon and just the pilot. I mean, we couldn't really talk about too much more, but um, about the pilot and then we can kind of project where it might be going with you all to a degree. Um, but Did yeah. we choose this because the pilot episode is on YouTube? No, that's a happy accident. Um, it they is? Released, uh, HBO that. released the pilot on YouTube for free. That's um, smart. Probably because they have to. They know that they have to win back people after butchering Game well, of Thrones. Right, but... I don't think it was that bad. No, the, and actually the second episode had even higher viewership than the first episode. That's very Oh, no, I meant... I meant that they, I think that they oh, yeah, they're trying, did they're that to because people goodwill. dropped. Yeah. No, do you know the reason? People you know the re had subscriptions just for Game of Thrones. What was Here's the reason? A, that may be true, but the other reason is they dropped it the day Lord of the Rings dropped. That's oh, like shakes. They're so great. Oh, they're yeah, yeah, so yeah. shifty in a yeah, good yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's That's a, a proactive marketing department. <laughs> yeah, not I'm with you, Elizabeth. I don't think it was that bad. I didn't think it was phenomenal, but I thought it was fine. I a watched it all beforehand though. Like I rewatched it right before the premiere of the last season. So I was super fresh. And so nothing was like really surprising to me. I was like, yeah, this all tracks. And it was quick, but I didn't think it was like the worst thing I'd ever seen in the world. Um, the, uh, the, I guess the point kind of of that though, is that there is a pop culture narrative that they completely butchered the end of Game of Thrones. Like, if you were going to do a pop culture scroll through, most of it would be negative. The reactions were ridiculous. I read a post that, uh, that was like a legitimate post, I believe, of a couple who literally divorced because of the last season of Game of Thrones. Like, they had built their relationship upon Game of Thrones, and it just tore them apart, and they divorced allegedly but i believe it that is the most extra thing i've ever it heard. was very extra they it were was getting divorced like, anyway people were betrayed yeah it was that's a fun thing. divorce that's like that's like a fun <laughs> that's a funny story that's that's the reason for i'm the glad divorce. they broke up my Last like my very quick analysis of it is we could have got there we could have got to the moment where danny stabs john and it could have really really been awesome and worked but John stabs danny yeah sorry whoops yeah okay. whichever way it goes we could have earned it but we didn't yet they really they had been very carefully laying the seeds of her being like a mad queen yes you know and when you rewatch it you see it but there was a leap where she went oh from God. i will be nuts to my enemies but i still take care of the common people to I will burn all of the common people massacre. It was it was a leap that she wasn't quite ready for. And I would have liked to see her get there, but I don't think that they effectively did it. But anyway. Yeah. And I read the leaks too. I knew all about the leaks. So maybe that had something to do with it too. So I already knew at, like what was gonna happen before I watched it. So I think I was already like, all right, let's go. It's the purple wedding. That's Joffrey. Joffrey's death. When he, cho oh. like, when he choked and his face goes purple. <laughs> I didn't get that. That's because yeah. you were not but, uh, into Game of Thrones discourse. <laughs> <laughs> but the yeah, other, no, I, uh, I watched it a lot. Thing is uh, this show had a lot of uh, negative uh, expectations to overcome. And it's very interesting how ready people were for it. Um, I My biggest uh, opinion on that is there's just been so many mediocre fantasy shows in the last two years. And to actually have like an HBO quality, <laughs> uh, 
yeah. fantasy show that has like reminded people, oh, this is just good TV. Yes, it's a fantasy show, but it's good TV. Um, say what you will about uh, how badly it ended. This reminded a lot of people of what they loved about the beginning of uh, the last series. And I think they captured, they did a great yeah. job capturing that. It's a family a saga that similar. happens to have dragons. This, I, that my biggest criticism is I think this is too similar to Game of Thrones. Um, really? Well, yeah, a little bit, yeah, but I mean, it's different enough. Like I'm so I'm 90% into it. I would just say the only reservation I have at all is like, Oh, this feels kind of familiar. They're all want the, there's a little flicker of incest. There's a, a, everybody is fighting over a succession event and there's going to be a fight for the Iron nitpicking. Throne. I am nitpicking, yeah. but I'm, my point is I loved everything else. So like, please, I'm, I'm glad they kept the theme song, you know, oh, yeah. that excited me. I was like, you know what? That's a really great carryover. And that also keeps that exciting like moment of when you hear the HBO crackle and yes. you know, Wait, that excitement. It wasn't it didn't they have a different theme but they used the old theme in the show the music they you say they kept the music they just made a new visual opening and the o new opening is so much better it's really good it's really good i could have yeah, sworn it was happy. a different i could have sworn it was it's different i don't remember the yeah it hit, it's the it same hit, song alexi it's because you didn't watch the second episode and it's because you didn't stay on for oh. the credits I watched Maybe they didn't okay, have the it on the first one. They didn't have it on the first one. They did not have the same theme. No, they the intentionally did because they wanted it to be a reveal when we the new world and we saw like the the like they made they, they it. withheld it for the first episode to the end and now every episode is going to start with it. Okay. Yeah, and the that second episode sense. starts with it. They have like the Yeah. Okay. The traditional so then, Game of Thrones opening. So then, okay. So I was I was not wrong. It does not start with it, but it ended with it in the in the first. And episode. the episode two started with it. Okay, that's kind of cool. I thought it was so, great because you, they had to win people over before they like called that car card. You know, yeah. Like it's they had nostalgia, to earn the, the but also the like theme song. emotion. Yeah, that's true. It's like if it, it gave us the hint that this was something new but also um, pulling it back. Like, I think that they did a really good job of weaving in little nostalgia points. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so let's do a quick, like the most brief, because we're not going to do a full uh, breakdown before we just start analyzing specific parts and specific characters and things that we, we enjoyed and we want to take away from it. But briefly... The arc of this pilot, I would say, is we're intentionally getting up to the point where she is named heir. heir. She has named his successor. Um, so do you all have any more comments on just like the overall shape of the pilot like that? Yeah. So the inciting incident of the series is obviously, spoiler alert, um, the death of the queen and the baby. Big spoiler mm -hmm. alert. Like, well, th this, that is, I think, the, the inciting incident that breaks her new world, uh, her normal world of, and like her sitting in her friend's lap being like, I'm comfortable like this. I just want to live and free. I don't want responsibility. It's kind of like the classic, like, uh, princess who's, who's happy with the status quo, but then has to deal with responsibility later thing. Um, the reluctant hero. Yeah. Yeah, although she seems pretty into it by episode two. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not going to spoil that for Alexi. Um, no, I've seen aspects of it. So what happened was I did watch episode two, but by that point it had the option of skip intro, like skip the theme. Oh, oh so so we can talk about that awesome yeah, you scene can. with the two dragons. Yeah, I, I love that. That was so That's surprising, funny. wonderful. They're so but, big. Um, but in terms of the pilot, yeah. we have her normal world. It's, you know, she... And her her relationship with her friend also changes through the episode. So I feel like the big the big themes the the big relationships are dynamics of her her and her father, which the normal world of that relationship is you're you can you know ride dragons and hang out, but you're like just the daughter. Your responsibility is maybe to marry the future, but like and to fill we're my not cup. like Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The cup bearer, but um. 
which is also interesting that she was a cup bearer before because usually uh, a king would want the cup like their child to be a cup bearer if they wanted them to be in on politics right like that felt a little interesting like um but forget it there's the relationship with her and her father which changes through the episode when he names her the heir and uh there's the relationship with her and her uh, best friend which you know she doesn't want to study history she's not really interested in like her responsibility and her friend her friends are kind of the same person allison sorry allison is like the same the high tower girl <laughs> mm -hmm. she's kind of the same person i think at the end it's just more of a real like she has that thing of the nail biting she has a lot of pressure that we're going to learn about probably with her father and her obligation to the crown princess um and then there's of course the relationship between her and her uncle daemon um which is i think the most interesting relationship so far I'm getting a little bit of incest vibes, but that's just because I know Game of Thrones really well. Wait, because between the princess and her uncle? Yeah, I got that. The, the, yeah, towards, I'm one way, one way, one way uh, incest. Uh, or just vibes. that kind of weird relationship where you have two, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's quite yet there or if it's just like this no, it's not competitive there yet. fun aunt uncle mm -hmm. thing where they're both kind of youngish. It felt like they were kind sons. of like. It, it probably would feel much more innocent if they didn't also already have plot lines of older men with young women mm -hmm. um, already happening. And if we didn't know. Right. The Targaryens. question's always going to be there with this family. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think like it was, it's a choice that they have made to already put in a couple like young love prospects for our king but um but yeah i guess i guess the brief walk through the episode remember we first started with the great council there was a there was a prologue at heron hall and they were deciding who was going to be the next heir of house targaryen and they got to choose between the person who i believe the queen that never was renaries or ren ren Rhaenys? Rainus, right? Rainus, something. Yeah, and, Rainus. Uh, and the first Viserys. Uh, and basically the, the princess was, if the princess was a boy, it would have been her seat. But um, they'd never had a woman sit in the Iron Throne. And so the council voted to get to his oldest grandson. Um, and then we immediately have, I think, like a like a nine year jump into his reign, um, where we understand that he is very preoccupied with having his own heir. Um, the only child that him and his wife had who has lived is their daughter, who is fifteen ish. Fifteen, I don't know. Um, and they, she's lost a lot of other pregnancies and babies. Um, and she tells him in the beginning, this is it, dude. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to try anymore after this because this is too taxing on me. And he, for whatever reason, is like, nope, it's fine. I, this is going to be my son. It's going to be great. Um, and we get to see a little bit of the conflict between the king and his brother who could be the next heir. Um, we get the feeling that he's like a dark horse. You know, he's like, he's the wayward brother that they can't figure out what to do with, um, who has a, a relationship with his daughter that's closer than she seems to be with, with her own dad, necessarily. Um, I'm getting a little bit more specific than I wanted, but I could just run through it, I guess. I um, so then what we see happen is we get to the tournament where the king is celebrating his heir, who is not yet born. <laughs> um, he's hosting a tournament in honor of his son, who is not yet born. Um, and there's jousting. Um, naturally, the uncle shows up and he's like a big force to be reckoned with at this tournament. And that gives us a chance to meet the other houses and to meet these knights, these tourney knights who have never seen combat um, the first time. 
So we're meeting them. We're with the princess and her friend as they watch this happening. Um, and meanwhile, the queen is giving birth. So we end up cutting back and forth between the jousting scene and this really intense labor scene where it's going wrong. Um, both of those situations continue escalating and reach a point where the the uncle is going to face off against basically a commoner for all intents and purposes. Um, and at the same time, the mother hits a point in the labor where it's not going to work. Um, and the king is brought in in order to decide you can leave it and see what happens if you want, or you can choose save your wife, or save the kid. But you'll probably get to keep one, but you will lose the other. Um, and it's this horrific scene that he, obviously, he chooses his unborn son. And he that we get some vibes that he does care about this choice that he's making. Like, he is, he's not just like, whatever, kill my wife but he chooses the son and it's a really bad moment stuck um, and in meanwhile we're we're cross-cutting between this like buddy brawl that broke out at the tournament um in the end he does have a son and his wife is dead um so then I think, I think I missed some of the uncle doing his gold cloak stuff because this was kind of happening in the meantime. The uncle's been put in charge of the city guard and or the city watch, and they're called the gold cloaks, and he's just causing all kinds of trouble. He had his men storm in just to make create fear, and um, we're setting up a really strong B-plot that's probably going to become a big antagonist later is what we're seeing. He goes in, they're just brutalizing people, they're declaring people criminals, and they're acting like they're doing this to specific people, but it does not seem as though it's specific at all. It seems like it's pretty much just wanton violence. Um, I'm trying to remember where else we go. Um... We have the commoner defeats the uncle at the tournament at the same time that we basically kill the wife and childbirth. Um, later on, we cut basically straight from him, his baby, but like dead wife to both of them are dead. The baby's dead. The wife is dead on a funeral pyre. Um, and it's clear that our princess, Renera hasn't talked to her dad that she's pretty she's pretty upset about this and pretty pissed and she has to be the one who steps up and gives the command for the dragon to burn her mom and brother and so already we're seeing that she has something in her that he doesn't have she has the ability to make tough calls and is going to be the one who can step up in these situations when he can't um, and so then almost immediately we go back to the small council and they are pressing him for what are you going to do about an heir now? Like that was your shot. It's gone. What now? Um, and he gets to choose between his brother and his daughter. Um, everybody in the city watch wants him to, or doesn't want him to choose the brother. They think that he's, the brother's wild and unrestrained. Um, and he keeps defending his, his brother. Um, I think that this is when basically the, it, it's looking like the king's going to try to give his brother a shot and convince people of it until the, until that night, the brother goes to a pub and, or to a brothel and, does a toast to the prince for a day 
really like making you know wasn't a solemn toast it was like i'm gonna pay for everyone here to have a great time and i'm gonna make fun of my brother's loss and um that really pisses off the king he does a power move talking to him in the iron throne and he decides nope you know what i'm going to give it to my daughter um so we see him talk to his daughter in the in the dragon room um and basically tell her the secret of the house targaryen which is obviously as we know from game of thrones something that's not going to come to fruition until later but that eventually winter is coming and there needs to be a targaryen on the throne to defend people against what is going to be coming from the north um and in telling her this she realizes that he's going to be naming her the heir um and they kind of have a making up moment where he's like i wasted a lot of time wishing for a son and i should have been training you and we get the impression that things are gonna that things are gonna really change um he's named her as his heir and so there's this big ceremony where everybody is going to pledge loyalty to her and him and we get to meet a lot of we get ancestors of family names that we know from game of thrones like stark and baratheon um more high tower and valerian and all these things and then she gets on her dragon and she flies away and that's the pilot so that's that's what we're that's uh what we're talking about hopefully i i'm sure i missed big things the one thing uh, i think I, I interpreted differently was in the childbirth scene, it wasn't presented, oh, you choose your wife, you choose your son. It was they'll both die or we could make save your son. I didn't get that impression at all. I, I thought, thought he it was choosing one or the other. And I thought that- I, I was presented that way, but like in terms of what he was saying, I- uh, I don't, I, maybe I can rewatch it. I, yeah, I yeah, thought that I, he intentionally chose the son. But like it was, yeah. it, 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 the guy was pitching, oh, you can save the son, but we don't know what will happen. If we keep, because she'll keep. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe I. I well, I mean, it wasn't as clear, he, I think. It was more like we can see what will happen. We can leave it and see what will happen, or right. we can definitely kill your wife and try and to save, save your the baby. Yes, yeah. no, no, it was definitely, but like uh, there was a chance they could both die, was even, the other way too. Yeah, I think it was implied that they could. I think it was that they could try to save the wife at the expense at the extent at the expense Expense of the baby yeah that was right that was what i understood regardless whatever it was he his choice guaranteed that his wife would die and the baby would live yeah and then he was soft in it and i think that was really important to show that he did not inherit the targaryen yeah gene right because i think that's where we're going with this is that he's soft he's a soft man He doesn't want to make the harsh decisions. And as we go forward into the war situations, he's not proactive. He's more reactive and soft. And that's going to be his his downfall as we move forward, right? But I think that's Mm -hmm. a uh, great uh, starting point for conflict. For sure. As a great dramatic uh, line from the uh, books is every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. Mm -hmm. Like... Is it is it going to be one of the bad ones or is it going to be one of the good ones? And it's always either or. And Damon's uh, the very opposite. Extreme. And Damon, Damon is, is the very other side cruel, of the coin. Like very yeah. cruel, very impulsive, very selfish, but mm-hmm. also very yeah. interesting to watch. And one of the interesting themes in the books that I don't think was really translated to the screen was no none of all the people around Daenerys didn't know which side she was going to come out on. Like she was always in flux. Like it was like she was the spinning coin was like the metaphor, um, mm-hmm. and in the show it was very much Khaleesi save us. Right, <laughs> you know, it was yeah. like oh she's so great, <laughs> but like in the books there was kind of like a a fourteen year old wouldn't kill shouldn't be so happy killing all these people. So my know? second watch, <laughs> like my second watch through the original show, I felt it was more the other way. I was like oh okay. My first time I was like oh she's yeah. great, but my second time watching I was like oh these are signs that I just I think I just didn't want to see them because I wanted to love her so much. 
Fair. So maybe that was like an implicit bias thing happening. I mean, they did a phenomenal yeah. job of positioning her as like the underdog. And I think that that was part oh, of for it too. sure. You, you like really her brother with. was such a dick. And like, and we were just, and it made, it put us on her side and she was in such a bad situation. I mean, like her marriage turned out fine with Cal Drogo, but like, was it fine? I mean, it was still not like. The books were she, horrific, that part. Yeah, that was. But, yeah, but that the part thing was about the books that I think the TV show didn't get at all is that all of the protagonists were way shittier. Like Jon Snow oh, yeah. was not as nice in the books. Uh, Tyrion was a monster. Like, oh yeah, he was he, awful. He committed sexual assault. He like was just he he ruined people's lives out of just total uh, flippant attitude. He like he murdered people who didn't deserve it. Like, and the show portrayed him as like this righteous underdog who just wasn't understood by his family, which was true. But that's the thing. Like, I think television viewers of mainstream shows were conditioned to have simplified non-nuanced character situations right. and the like, actors this is the guy we're rooting for or not like brought into that right because like as actors maybe they're like i don't really want to be this guy i want to be that's totally true i want to be left so yeah. he could have influenced that like and i think that as a character as an actor he probably had enough power to be like listen like especially let's, later on let's, let's push this in this direction a little bit more i would yeah. but i just i just like i like shows that embrace the nuance of like this person is bad and good and it depends yes. on your point of view um yeah and i don't i think the game of thrones kind of uh the show simplified certain things to make the heroes more digestible and get that oh i'm rooting for john feeling every week rather right. than be like which John's i think was shitty. a good idea yeah. i think was oh, a for, good sure, idea. for sure the, for sure for television it, show. a direct adaptation of these books i think would have been a little bit horrific and not oh for sure Enjoyable. Like if Tyrion was, if book Tyrion was on the screen, people would not be able to stand to look at his character arc. Not no, visually, it would be I a bunch of like, Joffreys. Yeah. Oh, everybody would be a Joffrey in the Lannisters, right? <laughs> yeah, Sorry, we're talking about the original show. We should talk about the prequel. But, no, but yeah, but, but like, do you, think, do you all think that there is that a little bit of ambiguity in our characters yet? Or I think with yeah. Rhaenyra's there is. Yes. You think so? Mm -hmm. Damon, we're getting a little glimmer of his conflict. Like he's not, like I don't. I get the sense of a he's psychotic in one hand, but he's also soft with his family. Like yes, he, I don't. He is. I actually think when that that there was that great scene where he was overhearing the council and his his brother was defending him to the high tower against Otto High Tower, and he was like saying, "Your brother just wants to position himself at the throne." Like, My brother doesn't want that, and then. You see Damon listening in and he laughs to himself. You could sort of interpret that as I do love my brother. Yeah, but there's no life. space for me here. You know, like that was kind of the vibe. Yeah. Like I don't know if he wants to be king yet. No, he's a, he's a, I think he's a second son who wants to live his, you know, little dream world and cause havoc, but he doesn't realize how much havoc he causes by his little moments. Right. Mm -hmm. And he definitely seems to have a narrative about himself that he uh -huh. is doing good thing. Like, like he doesn't he doesn't seem to be. He did with the gold cloaks pretty bad, right? He wants he to be adored just, and re yeah. revered. Not maybe not adored, but revered and and respected, respected by fear. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did I did hear that one of the showrunners already left the show, which uh, Miguel uh, Sapachuk. Which, what's oh. interesting is that he already has another HBO job, though. So like, he's got it wasn't a first look. Like, he's got a first look deal. Yeah, um, which is major, just, which is great. Yeah, so that's uh, so it's definitely not like an unamicable like he was fired thing. No, it's a good know. thing. It's yeah. he's moving on to start his own creative endeavors, and from what I've read, everybody involved is very passionate and is very capable of of bringing the show um, everything that it needs to have. And I he's bet just. You, Moving. I bet you he came on to like make sure the first season went on. Okay, because they wanted a more experienced showrunner to start it off, probably. Yeah. That's so what do you all think? If we're kind of imagining this the season as like a movie, right? Like this if we're imagining how the season is gonna play out, what do you all think is gonna be like the big 
the big tent pole things like what's her is her objective to get on the iron throne does she not have one yet um is she i mean she's positioned as our protagonist but she hasn't really gone for anything specific yet it's the iron throne it's the iron throne and and responsibility she wants to Mm -hmm. secure her position as heir and how do you do and what kind of of what kind of queen would she be right is she going to be like her father or is she going to be who she wants to be, which is this kind of badass dragon riding person of myth, very similar to how Damon is, has this illusion of himself. I think that she has de- is starting to develop that. I think there will be a show off between the two of them, between Damon and Rhaenerys, and there will mm-hmm. be a moment where she betrays her father. That's my second prediction. I unfortunately know what happens because uh, okay. I read the prequel I haven't. Book. I have not read. Um, you read prequel. what? The prequel book. This is based on a book that he wrote. I didn't know that this was actually a, a book. That this was a yeah, book. yeah, no. George R. R. Martin wrote a uh, prequel that's like kind of like a history of like yeah, the it's more of like family. a compendium, right? Yeah, but uh, and so this is very much expanding uh, a very simplified story, but like it's it's like a quasi history, but like um, yeah, I know what happens. Uh, I I don't want to spoil it. Am I on? This... Am I on the right track? Sort of. I, I actually, you know. The the you've guessed the wrong antagonist for her. I have, and she's okay, in. A, sorry, and the and the antagonist is in the pilot. Okay. And it's is the antagonist? Super, it's her friend. Yeah, I was about to say that. Not going to say anything. Friend. Not going to say anything. Yeah. I mean, I know I will eventually spoil myself by by reading threads and threads of discussion on the internet, like I did with Game of Thrones, and the the amount when watching Game of Thrones, the amount of lore that I knew just from reading threads of discussions was unreal. This is a good guess, but I also think it's more interesting and fucked up. Uh, sorry, that, 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 that's just my... Well, right, they're going to get married, so her, her Allison that, is going to have heirs. So if that, that happens, that's do. a direct threat against her. Yeah. And that's and an interesting dynamic, because the they used to be best friends. Yeah. And she doesn't necessarily, like... It's hard to figure out exactly how Allison's feeling. I've not... like I, I get that she's anxious, because no, they, but her dad been... has created this, though. Yeah, her dad definitely is like like she's it's definitely being will. pushed. Yeah, but it's hard to tell yet. It was great that what they revealed she that really late, feels though. about it. That they revealed like, what part? That her father's involvement, because for the first like three quarters of that episode, it felt like she was actually developing this relationship with her best friend's father, which the way they presented it was great conflict because it's like oh is she really love her her dad's her her friend's dad but then we see oh no actually the hand of the king has been creating this all along which yeah, is it's- just like it's really great conflict and it's great setup like in this pilot we have set up already like 17 conflictual situations that could go any which way and that gives mm-hmm. an intrigue to the audience and that is what i think is great about the game of thrones universe is everyone wants to know how is it going to go? Not yeah, just what happens. We know kind of what's going to happen, but how is it going to go? Yeah. she's a, Her climax is going to be something likely determining whether or not she gets the Iron Throne. Like, that's what we're building towards, is some sort of fight for the Iron Throne. And... Um, against who? We don't know. Who's going to be her allies? We don't know. Is her dad going to keep supporting her? We don't know. <laughs> you know? Right, probably because she not, could because go against conflict. him. She could yeah. say, well, I'm queen now. Screw you. Uh, Michelle, agreed. Uh, yeah, I, I would so be down for that. I actually wanted for Daenerys to become the queen, um, like the night queen. I had this whole like fan theory of what should have happened. I almost wrote it. I should have. It would have been great. Like the night queen? You mean she would have like destroyed the world? No, that she would have like taken over the throne of the night king but like in not in a good way but in a way that she was like gonna retreat into the darkness kind of and they would have this like you know i don't think it was building that way but she was the fire fire in the song of ice and fire right no i know but it would have been so great if like if if she took that over and it was that was her sacrifice and then she and john had this like uh, yeah, because he's he's the fire too. 
No, he's the ice. Well, he's the Tycarian. But he's the, you know, the yeah. Prince of Thomas. Also a Stark, right? Mm-hmm. So. But then I love, I just thought, I was like, man, that would be so, like, up my alley of how I would have loved their <laughs> story the to go. Go for it. I thought about it. I thought about it real hard. I have a treatment so, of it somewhere I'll share it with y'all. Yeah, I'll also bring up, I think this show, for its, uh, for good and bad, is about, like, the show, this world is about patriarchy, right? Like, yes. This is, like, literally about, like, male succession in a feudal system and, like, the women who have to navigate that system, which is a good dramatic premise, but, like, yeah, it's, uh, unfortunately, the the world of Game of Thrones. Um, and we need other fantasy shows at, in other worlds <laughs> to balance out yeah. that uh, War of the Roses historical angle. Yeah. So I think what is something that this pilot does agree agree yeah. oh for sure for sure agree yeah. agree with this yeah um Every what's time something the, that this they cut back to john at the wall i'd be like oh god <laughs> here we go yeah <laughs> <laughs> what's um what's something in this pilot that would be good to think about in our own pilot scripts for writing specs or not specs if we're writing an original pilot Something like that. Showing the characters failing. I think it does a really good job of that. And I think that's such an important aspect of like how to showcase the flaw is like to show them actively failing in what they're doing or like what they're doing that isn't working. And I think, and especially for Viserys, you know, it gets into into the, the second episode where we see this hesitation and his inability to be proactive um, is going to, we, we see already that that's going to lead into a really big freaking issue for him. And for the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, my, uh, I have two things. One is really, this show really establishes great ticking bombs in the yes. form of relationships. Like, you mm -hmm. know, things are going to blow up between her and her uncle. You know, things are going to blow up between her and her best friend. You know, things like, and like having each of those ticking clocks feel different and like attacking mm -hmm. a different aspect of who she is, like, that's almost part of the new world um, hook of at the end of the pilot is she's standing there and you just know like there are these ticking bombs, things that are going to go off. And part of that, that, that is what's going to keep people wanting to come back saying how that plays out. How is this going to blow up? Uh, how is it gonna play out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd say that the thing that I am going to definitely incorporate into any pilots that I'm doing is for every crappy thing a character did, they also did a good thing. Like they gave us two, they gave us two sides to a lot of different characters. Like right at the very beginning, this king seems just like he doesn't want to be like war hungry. And you're kind of like, okay. Then he makes this choice and his wife dies a really terrible death because of his choice. And we see that there's like still like contrast in that he chose a really crappy thing, but we see, we kind of understand why. And we see how he feels about it. We see that he's not just doing this, like a cold ruler, like, like bye wife. He like actually feels things about it. Um, and then we see him make a different choice later where he tells his daughter that she's going to be his heir and he apologizes for how he's regarded her. So we already, with him, get a bunch of these different, um, like, highs and lows. They're all in pursuit of the same thing. You know exactly what he wants. He wants a strong heir. He wants, that's his whole deal, is he's not particularly concerned about what he's doing as king. He's kind of just like, coasting by but what he wants is to know that he has an heir who's going to take the iron throne next you know one and um things, oh sorry you, you can no go ahead. go ahead one of the best things that plays off of that is the confrontation between him and his brother at the end um when he's mm -hmm. confronting him he's, he's sitting there he's got his sword he's on he's making a power display and his brother just tells him you're weak you're afraid and you're weak you need someone like me like I should be your heir because everybody sees you not con like trying to avoid military conflicts. Everybody sees you focusing on tournaments and stuff. 
And while, yeah, we see that as like, oh, that's likable, but like the, the nuance of the situation is he's also a bad king probably. He is, he's wasted yeah. all this money, uh, you know, a tournament for his era that hasn't even been born. That's a, just a terrible financial decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know, <laughs> it's it's that that's what makes good drama, right? The bad guy has a point. Yeah, the good guy, or in that situation, you're you're rooting for the king because you saw the you saw more fucked up behavior from. Well, they both have done messed up things. That's what's great about the show. But like, they're both right and they're both wrong, right? Like, he's right that his brother would probably be a bad king for one extreme, but his brother's right yeah. that he'd be a bad he's a bad king for the other extreme. And uh, there's nobody yeah. who's a balance yet, except for maybe the potential of uh, Renera. So I would say that also the thing that, um, what was it? Oh, just that it, it's like, you you do get their point, especially like reflecting, like when they're randomly like, oh, and this guy who feeds people to crabs is killing all my people. Oh, yeah. Can you oh, help? Yeah. And he's yeah. just like, eh. I'm like, are you kidding? I'm just going to casually yeah. drop in that this man is feeding people to crabs. Because and, he's so uh, privileged in his spot because they've never had war that he's probably like, how, how bad can it be getting aimed by a crab? Like, come on. <laughs> he's like, oh, he sounds cute. Yeah. <laughs> crabs are all right. But like, they're yeah. also like, it sets up a lot of like B and C plots really well. I think where we know, like we don't even have the, the plots established yet, but the threads are there and they're, they're so well placed that we know there's going to be conflict here, 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 and here. And we're interested in these characters. Like I'm interested in um, what's his name in episode two, the um, Valerian, you know, where he's actively you know, conflicting against the king's decisions and he wants him to marry his child and all of these things. And that's Master what I think Jim's sets, yeah, background. what sets yeah. Game of Thrones, like this whole universe apart is that all of the B and C plots have really well-designed characters who have a history that provides conflict and also like a present want or need that provides conflict. Mm -hmm. I think I'm working on a, a pilot right now just kind of for fun and the thing that i'm gonna do you know after watching this is i'm gonna really think through like the people i've set up as as good guys and the people i've set up as bad guys and what are some choices that they can make that go on that are in, like that go to both sides of that like what good thing mm -hmm. can my bad guy do this episode to make that him like a more dynamic and interesting character and like similarly what's something that we might not have approve of that my protagonist can do um to show room for growth and to also show like to get interesting questions about like who's gonna do what you know i think yeah. i think that yeah they've set up tons of these like different little relationships and they could go a million different ways. And I think that that's what's really cool about it. Mm -hmm. I love the violence, the crab eating stuff. I thought that was great. I know. I was like, I that, that just, the Ugh. moment that happened, I was like, oh, yes, yes. So Maybe excited. I'm sick. But like, the, and it's the so jousting good. violence, oh, the, I just want to start with the jousting scene. I, I just did not know which way it was going to go. Like I, they were setting it up for the prince to just dominate. And he starts that way. But like the fact that he loses... To this like Dornish rando. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. And also what was something I'm curious about is who he gave um, oh, the Hightower girl his favor. Yeah. That was kind of interesting. Thousand. I yeah. was not expecting that. Yeah. Which will be interesting, I think, for Rhaenerys where she's going to be looking at Alicent and thinking like, what does she have that I don't? Because in her mind, she's she's the princess, she should be the most adored and the most desired. And yet here's Alison, who's, you know, pre presented as a very like quiet and mousy girl. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be interesting in their friendship. Cause I think the two women who are friends at that age are always comparing themselves to each other in very like toxic ways. And I really hope that they, and I, I, I know they will like explore this in interesting ways. They're definitely going to get that way. Like the scene with them talking about the histories and her being on her lap being like, I, I'm comfortable right here. And 
that there's just a sense from Allison that like she's not satisfied with their mm-hmm. status quo, like that she wants something. Maybe it's like jealousy. Absolutely jealousy. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, I mean, she's jealous. She's yeah. jealous that her dad, that Renera's dad, is not yeah. on her back. Exactly. Like, I was like, he's a dad. very like hands off right. guy who's like yeah. letting her do whatever. And then meanwhile, That's the such dad's like very. There's like these these mirror images in these characters, and I think we've been talking about it this whole time. But like to call a point to it, each of these characters like they have those mirrors, yeah. and that provides really great internal conflict. Oh, the, the relationship with their fathers is such a contrast. That's so. Also, Otto is posi- Otto is also a complex character in the sense of like, on one hand, he's accurately criticizing the prince, and he seems to be presenting a rational point of view and like being important, like giving like, you know, counsel to the king. But he's also exploiting the king yes. and manipulating him. Isn't and, he the one who says, I don't envy you? Like, I still miss my wife and I don't envy this position that you're in. But yeah, you do need to get there. married. But right he after that, he's, he pushes his daughter on him to kind yeah. of flirt with him. And like, oh, also, at, when that first happened, when she first, when he first told her, I was like, oh no, oh no, what's going to happen? And the scene where he's like playing with his model of the city and she's- I'm glad they haven't. Her. I'm glad that they at least gave us like an, an episode- <laughs> or two of them not getting together. <laughs> I'm glad that they didn't just like do yeah. that immediately. I do feel like Otto's the new little finger. That's my- uh, He's 100% the new yeah. little finger. Um, he's very sh- he's very shifty. And I think that he's gonna make some very intelligent and like under the table plays. And the way they revealed that was really brilliant because like when you said, when he's telling him, you know, you do need to get married, we think, at that point in time, he's saying, marry the kid. Yeah. But really, then it's revealed, actually, marry my daughter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that and that scene where he, and this is in the second episode, where he's walking with uh, the 12-year-old through the garden. It's just, like, such a brutal image. Like, oh, my God. And when she ha- says the rehearsed lines that her dad, so basically, this is all like shitty fathers uh, forcing their daughters to to fulfill these roles. daddy issues. Daddy yeah. issues, yeah. So and one I thing mean, I want to talk about. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, go, no, no, go ahead. I was I was just agreeing that it's very like it's showing we're getting more of the women side of Game of Thrones that we. I mean, we did see that. We did get that, but it's definitely more direct Forefront. and like we get to see like different ways that it can manifest in different people you know you have the daughter pushed to the side you have the daughter who's pushed forward into men that she does not want to be with you have the queen that was completely shot like that was supposed to get something and was shunned you're getting a bunch of different versions of what it's like to be a noble lady in this space and all the different ways that all the different challenges that women faced in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm giving up your dreams. <laughs> I'm giving up your dreams. That's how it goes. Yeah. She goes, you're giving up your dreams. No, dad. I'm giving up your dreams. And you go to the, to the singing thing instead of the... Or she stops whatever. away. Yeah. Adam, what were you going to say? Something I else forgot. you wanted? Oh, was no. It <laughs> no, it's okay. It was not that good. Was it Something... the conversation with the... Oh, with yeah, the I, I remember. No, it was a pivoting to... Okay, this is a minor spoiler people don't know, but, like, the, it's established that there's going to be a time skip sometime in season one and that there are older versions of all the characters that have been cast. As kids. And the, no, as adults. No, I mean like that the the kids are all recast. I don't think they're recast. Yes, yeah, so, although they're, they're not everybody. The kids yeah. are all recast. Uh, so there's for like ten years in the future or something, um, and that's going to be extremely interesting to sort of. There's a before and an after something, and I don't necessarily know what that is, but um, because in the in the book it's not framed that way at all. It's just sort of he tells us the history. So I think they might be intercutting between the past and future. That would be very interesting. 
because I hope because the, the young cast is so strong. I don't want them to. Uh, They're so great. I, I know. know. I want them to like, get their jobs. Right I Jeez. don't want her going anywhere. She's great. I'm, but I'm very I do think that the daughter, place. if they're going to keep around the daughter of the queen that never was and the captain of ships, she's going to be a freaking force, is my. Uh, well, prediction. at that age, to be already like politically aware enough to be able to handle that situation. Like, even though her, yeah. you know, the dad gave her stuff to rehearse, like, she handled that. I was surprised. Like, I was like, wow, like, this girl, she's smart. She knows what she's doing, even if she doesn't yeah. want to do it. So, seeing that character in 10 years. It might be interesting. It might be interesting. She'll to be see shrewd. Mm -hmm. How did the wedding? Who gets married to who? Will be interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Right, also, because there, there's also a very intense situation that will happen at some point, right? For sure. I also thought the scene where she picked out the knight was very interesting. Yes, and that was the knight who who beat Damon. Yeah, and I think maybe that's why she picked him. Um, also, that he had combat experience, and everybody else was like, "You're all just sort of." <laughs> Rich kids, your sons, tournaments. Tournaments. Your yeah. tar tournaments. This guy actually killed somebody, you know. <laughs> Can you? She's probably like, he's actually killed someone. There's going to be something there. Actually, I feel feel like the biggest conflict so far in terms of relationship isn't the uncle and her. It's it's her and Otto because he's constantly undercutting her. Mm, it's true. In the room. For, for, from Otto's point of view, he sees her as his biggest obstacle, right? Because yeah. yeah. He's, he wants his daughter to be queen. He wants his his grandchildren to inherit the throne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And his, his and, line to succeed. Yeah. Wasn't he one of the ones that's always dismissing? Like, because I think it was in the pilot episode where they're discussing the situation of the, the crabs. And she basically is like, go in there Sometimes. and F them up. Yeah. <laughs> like... Yeah. Like, yeah, go show them, give them a show of force. And then it's sort of like, gasp, you're not supposed to be talking. Um, mm -hmm. And then know. she does it. You know, she takes, was, yeah. she takes it into her hands and does that with Damon when he's holed up a Dragonstone. And mm -hmm. really, I, now that I'm looking, thinking about it, the conflict there really, I mean, it was between her and her uncle, but it was really between her and Otto. Yeah. And she kind of just upstaged him. And B and one, you know, he was going to make a. I, I don't know what the fuck he was thinking. That, that's they were going to die. They would have died. They would have all died. They would have died. A dragon. He he showed up to a guy who was a dragon, and that he showed up to a die. dragon fight with with a sword. Yeah, yeah. He was going to lose that. <laughs> that was such an intense moment, like where it's like, okay, they could battle on this bridge and maybe lose. Like yeah. the the bad guy, they could maybe take back this castle. And incredible like, shot, though. Oh, yeah, so beautiful, so beautiful. Also, I love how different the dragons look. Yeah. In the original Game of Thrones, all the dragons kind of look the same. I get they were twins or whatever. No, no, they weren't twins. They were just siblings. But they were siblings. Yeah. I like, like how, and how long big they the are. Dragon so neck big. was. Yeah, like huge. if you look at the size of her riding that dragon and you compare that to shots of Danny riding the dragons in Game of Thrones, like it's ridiculous the size. Well the idea was mm -hmm. that they were getting smaller and smaller with yeah. every generation. Mm -hmm. So this is like the prime of it. But I think it's gonna be interesting to see like the conflict that's gonna happen because Rhaenyra's is up against Otto and she's gonna continue to do these things because she won this and she's gonna feel really great. But then that's going to cause conflict with her and her dad because he's going to be like, "Hey, can you can you not?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please. It's they've set up a lot, and I think it's it's interesting that like as we talk about it, we figure out more and more about like, you know, this is how good exactly. Writing, yeah, I think that that is like a hallmark of good writing is that clearly there's a lot of thought into what all these characters want, and I think that that yes. makes it interesting. Their um, wants, their needs, their flaws you know, what's holding them back, which I'm sure that they played out like five different scenarios and said, this is the best one that gives us the most conflict everywhere because it, ha it can't just be with one character, you know, with Rhaenerys, Otto and her dad, Viserys, like that has to be a triangle of conflict. Mm -hmm. And also there's, the, there's that interesting parallel from the previous generation's decision about who to, who to choose because there was a there was the it's like this it's like history repeating itself mm -hmm. 
the succession uh, crisis that her father won is being paralleled in the present. And the question, and the world chose the man over the daughter last time. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out this time. Uh, like, it's like, there's a parallel of what immediately happened framing. I mean, and the fact that they showed that first was really, I think, smart exposition. Um, I, it really was. I don't think the queen is gonna necessarily be on her side. No. Is my impression. No, they did not think, have a great no. relationship. I think because, that yeah. it seems like she's gonna be upset that you know it was already kind of mentioned in episode two, but like, you know, the queen basically is like they didn't choose a queen, and she says, No, I didn't choose you. So she clearly has this narrative in her head about why she wasn't chosen and that it was just about the system and like why things are done, like, you know, just how things are done. And by Renaris or whatever, Renera, Renaris, Renera, um, by her becoming the heir slash eventually taking the throne, it's completely over now. It's uh, it's it's disproving her narrative that it was never going to happen and that it like wasn't her fault. Even though I think you know there's a version of this where she could be like I paved the way for her and like this is a victory for all of us. But I don't think so. in such a no, it's like in such a patriarchal world, it really turns women against women. And I think yeah, because she's like, oh, like you didn't even want this and it was given to you. You don't you don't even know. You know you have mm -hmm. no idea what it means to want and fight for this. But that will change, of course, as she, you know, decides she wants to want and fight for it. But it's it's also part of what makes this world interesting is the obligations people make are not for ideas. It's for like, I mean, they are for ideas, but it's like, it's about family. It's about family yes. power and positioning. And everyone cares about that. And in that mm -hmm. world, it's like, well, yeah. It was more about my family having power than me supporting a female queen, right? Like, like she's like, yeah. I, I wouldn't support you because it's not my family. It's not my power. It's not my name, right? There's this real interest. And the whole thing about uh, the, the dads wanting a son to pass on, it's, uh, the reason he killed his wife or can, voted to have her killed, no, voted he was a king. But uh, the reason he did that was for his family positioning or his legacy because like that was like it's like base survival that everybody cares about in this world and it's kind and of a, like an important thing too though was that she stated very clearly i'm not doing this again so yeah he's right. not going to yeah. save her because he knows listen i save her i'm not getting another chance this is my legitimate only chance of this happening i think that was an important setup yeah it was and like when she said that i was like girl you can't say that you got you gotta, you gotta wait. You can't. I guess she trusted him. People, uh, part of the joy of uh, this world is also seeing uh, people you kind of empathize with make horrible decisions you know are just going to destroy them in the future. And uh, I don't think things are going to go well for anybody. And that's part of the fun. <laughs> it, is, it is part of the fun, isn't it? I really hope, though, that they make her best friend smart. You know, she'll be kind of like, yeah, well. yeah. 100%. I want her to like, I want her to make the best of her crappy situation. Yeah. But that will and destroy their friendship. Like her absolutely. cunning decisions <laughs> are going to ruin ev like everything for them. Oh, yep. I can't wait. I, can't I know wait. I'm here for it. The character dynamic and the, oh, that's, it's going to be the good stuff. Uh. It's like the show more <laughs> after talking about it. <laughs> this is what makes this such a great show though and why it's been such a grip on people because of the care like the care that it takes to to come up with all of this but also like the world building like it's you don't you're not able to make these decisions about characters if you don't have a world that backs it up and systems in place and you know the politics the history like I yeah. so much of it I mean, this is a patriarchal world, but like they made very con concrete decisions about what that meant and what that means to these people. And I feel like one of the reasons so many other fantasy shows 
um, leave your consciousness the moment you finish them is that they don't make decisions about that. It's just all assumed, right? Like I don't even remember Shadow and Bone, which we did like a year ago. Like no. I, like I, I barely remember what that was about and who, what the, what the drama was. Like I remember what happened and the images of it. Like I don't remember the social political situation and what people believed and what they cared about because it was just kind of like all assumed. Whereas this yeah. show makes very specific, like it's all about that. It's all about the how the characters react to those ideas and like what they go after it. Like you've got a sense of what the rules are. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. and everything yeah. is a setup. Like every line is a setup for something. Yeah, mm -hmm. that will pay and off. I've, the other thing I will say about this too is it shows that how bogus it is that when people say like, "Well, I'm doing a World War II story. I can't sh like I can't have women." in it you know who was fighting world war ii it was guys or like who were knights like that that was like a that's a common thing that i hear a lot is that like well i'm doing something historical and historically there weren't women there so why would i but they were you know but they were yeah or like there was maybe only not people. maybe not on the front lines but <laughs> they no, but like, also it's not i, like I they feel didn't like exist. this is yeah you know. well you know if we're going to make, if you're, I assume you're making a parallel of like, like this is inspired by War of the Roses and therefore is historically patterned and therefore they made sh show more about uh, the women experience in that power structure. I think women experience in that power structure was like so, I mean, look at the rise of Queen Elizabeth, you know, and yeah. Mar like the Mary Queen of Scots, like there were really interesting women in feudal <laughs> feudal and medieval history and like they're had who ha had brushes with power and dealt with succession wars and all of that like I, I don't feel like this is that different from history it's like or like so the history it's patterned saying. itself out of yeah that's what it I'm is. saying is Thank that you. I'm saying that like but it is a common excuse that people give like where sure. like there was like no women in like these they like, like like this war movie or whatever and it's like it I mean that it's a choice that you're allowed to make, but don't pretend that it's not a choice, right? For sure. Like, but I also think there's a different, like there's a difference in saying like you're making a battle, uh, like let me say you're making a film about the battle of Okinawa in World War II, the Pacific theater. And you said, well, there are no women in this movie. It's like, well, or no, Guadalcanal, right? Well, no, it was battalion of men were stranded on an island for two weeks, right? Like mm -hmm. the women were the Japanese villagers. Yeah. I mean, but like, like there, there were the people on that island, right? Like, and if you're making a movie about history rather than a movie inspired by history, like, I feel like that's the division, right? Like, like I think, I think there is something to be said for like portraying history as it is, so we can learn from it. Like, if the purpose of the story is to render it as it was, rather than yeah. like I want to be inspired by this. Um, but those are also but, a lot of assumptions of how it was. Yeah, it is. Right. It's like, like even if it some, is in some cases. Like the population was still 50 50 when all this was happening. So, like, yeah, the of odds course. of there being no, like, if you're going to stay in the bottom of a pit and there's only two guys there, then, like, fine. But, like, it for the most part, it's just which perspectives of the story and, like, which facets of the story does history tend to, to, tend to tell? Yeah. For sure. I, the only thing that rubs me the wrong way is like choices that were like you erase the identity of the actual person by like changing things that were core about their name. Yeah. Like you can't do a story about Henry VIII and make him a woman. I mean, you could, you could do like a theatrical interpretation you where you switch gender. If it was could, interpreted, like for yeah, film, that would be an it's a biopic film. Yeah, that's presented as like, oh, this is a historical film. I feel like there is kind of like a a responsibility to because a lot of young people will watch things. It's kind of like the Hamilton effect. Right, like all these people, young people on the internet, started taking it literally. Like, oh, Hamilton was anti-slavery. Well, no, he wasn't. Right. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's that's actually not true. Like, young people are given an incorrect view about the person, what they believed, um, because it was more sanitized for a show. Right. Because like, I feel like that's the way we're in a modern lens. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Which which we do like naturally we're going to look at something through a modern lens, but we also have to look at it through what was the lens of, of those That's days. Right. Like the people people existing in the 1800s were absolutely going to have views that are abhorrent to us today, but at the time were social norms. Like we probably all have views today that in 200 years are going to be considered 
disgusting. You know, they're just yes. I, I think a better. Although I will of, say that yeah, I don't think that people should. This is like my beef with studying history overall is I do think though that to a degree this might not actually be screenwriting topics so I'll say it fast but like we kind of know what's crappy today yeah. it's just that it's not a commonly it's not commonly accepted that we all are going to admit that it's crappy but like we're aware of crappy things and I think but we, that, as like, we assume that though but there may just like how back in the day, you know, people used to spread, um, what was it, arsenic all over their faces, you know, because this means more that like that socially, was, yeah, like, so, yeah, like, like I think that there may be things 200 years from now, like there may be customs that change so much that what we do would be like, for example, if, if the idea of marriage is abolished completely and the idea of monogamy is abolished completely in 200 years they're going to look back at people who are married right now and think they were so backwards they, that why would they do that? Right. Mm -hmm. So there, there will be different lenses and that doesn't mean that we're morale, like that we're wrong right now for anything. There are just things that change. Yeah, there yeah, are things that are, that are just inherently terrible. Obviously I think we can all see those things, but I think that there are some things that are nuanced as we change and as we grow and learn things about, history and science and technology and all of all of these aspects. I think, look how different we so the social context of the last 20 years is. Like what was yeah. okay to say on television 20 years ago is not okay today. It's going to be that way 20 years from now. People are going to look at the things we say and be like, oh, how yeah. terrible. What I resent <laughs> though is people being like, it's okay that he was pro-slavery because of the time. It doesn't mean that no, he was no, bad. Exactly. I'm like, it was always a bad, like, it was always bad. It's not like these people genuinely thought that it was a nice thing to do. They thought it was justified. But anyway, yes. justified I'm is a good thing. Thing. A good hey, can, can I bring up this comment? Oh, this is great. Yeah. This is just a sad show. Where's the vul vulgarity? We love the Game of Thrones. What are you talking about? There was a castration in the pilot. We saw a man <laughs> get his penis chopped up, and then we saw the penis of the bloody remains of it. If that's not vulgarity, then that was the first violence and of the, the show. And the C-section. And the C-section, which was, that was extremely graphic, and the jousting. We were in the, the brothel, weren't we? Faces break. <laughs> what? And we were in the brothel, right? We went to a yeah, brothel. Yeah, we, we saw we saw male and female uh, asses. We saw um, many uh, breasts. I don't know. I, I don't feel like it was not vulgar. Maybe it's not as compared to the pilot for the original Game of Thrones. This was more vulgar. I think yeah, I think the so. original pilot was just them like getting their pups. Yeah, Some and coming guy to running out Winter of the Winterfell. Woods. Yeah, the only thing was uh, Cersei and Jaime uh, getting it on, which is, you know, I think that people like the the sex explanation scenes where you know Littlefinger would be explaining politics in the brothel, and we'd be watching. Right, fair. This is not this as is funny. True. This is this is definitely true. I would completely agree that it's not. Um, but we not didn't as funny. have that in in episode two either, like in Game of Thrones. Humor. Oh yeah. Yeah, that that was developed over time. I would say, but Tyrion was always funny. I would say. I don't think there's a character like Tyrion in the show. Right. Which is kind of an interesting observation because sort of like, like an irreverent. No. Yeah. He he was like an outsider who was like his the point of, the way they framed him is like he was a man he was a man who didn't fit in the times he was living in. Like he had right. like kind of an outsider perspective almost, which was mm -hmm. very interesting. And I, I did like that a lot about his character. And there's no character like that in this show. Currently. Um, yeah. Currently. Hopefully. Hopefully we get one. That would be nice. Because yeah, I well, guess I do yeah. kind of miss the humor. It there's wasn't so like a funny show. Yeah. Like this yeah, could go this, in so many directions. This but is I don't more think our main show. princess girl, I don't I don't see her cracking jokes anytime soon. If I'm not. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> Yeah, no, she she is not in a, a fun and games mood. Um, yeah, this is a more serious show. I didn't even think about that. Thanks for bringing that up. That point. Um, it's a way more serious show, but very good. I really like it. Yeah. So I next week, a good next week we are going to be doing a another topic coffee class, which is finding your next story. So we're talking about choosing ideas. How do you decide what's what you should do next? How do you decide what to commit to? That's a big one. Yes. You have like a zillion viable? ideas. Yeah, if you have like, a list is of it ten viable? ideas? How to? Which one should you go with? Um, mm -hmm. 
I know yep. I struggle with that sometimes. <laughs> and we actually have everything planned out for this month. So top down, I could just run through the list, but it will be on our page. Um, next week we are doing how do you find the next story? So ideas. Um, then September 16th, we are going to be watching the film after Yang. Um, we're going to be breaking that down with you all. On the 23rd, we have a special, special guest coming, and we will announce all the details about her soon. And then on September 30th, we are going to, if possible, we're going to try to get John to come in, and we're going to finally talk Casablanca. <laughs> Maybe John will rewatch it and be like, you know, this isn't as good as I remember it. That'd be oh, hilarious. my God. Beautiful. That'd be I great. should send him some like mess. Alexa, you're gonna like it. <laughs> I, no, I tried shit. to watch it three times. Oh, you've seen Definitely. it, and you don't yeah. like. I, uh, I, I've seen it twice. I, um, I like it. There are a lot of things I do like about it, but there's some things I'm like. But I mean, it, it, I don't think it's as good as everybody says it is. It, but for me, it's like we're watching yeah. this from a lens of right now. But yeah, I, here's what I think. I, I I don't think it's as good as a lot of the stuff that was coming out back then. Like I think there's yeah. so many better movies. Yeah, of that, I mean, there were a lot of good, age Hollywood. There were films. a lot of there were a lot of good movies. Like there's so many good movies from that like, era. Like Casablanca is not my top, but I do think it's you know it's good. Film. It's good. I just don't think I, I don't get the people who are like it's the greatest screenplay ever made. I was like, really? <laughs> no. Right, right, no. exactly. But it's good, we'll though. talk it's about good. it with John. John will tell us why he freaking loves it, apparently. And um, and it'll be a lot of fun. So we'll see you all next week when we talk about ideas. All right. Thank you, everybody. Adios. I added music to that, so I'll. Is it working? Send that to you. No, yeah. it's not. We're still on. We're still on, Alexi. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to Never play mind. this. Yeah, and then you cut it short. No. <laughs>